the movie preview critic, informing and entertaining your movie world. What's up, good movie lovers? Welcome to the Box Office Breakdown, where at the beginning of each week, the box office numbers of the most recent movie weekend are decoded and hopefully the movie truth is revealed. Opening weekend numbers are what determine the future of H-Wood. From a surprise indie hit to a big budget piece of sh the box office returns are the traffic signals that the studios obey. These numbers create ramifications for the careers of the filmmakers, especially the director, actors, and writers. So let's take a look at the numbers and figure out what this means for the movies and for us, the cash-paying audience that keeps the wheels of the monolithic entertainment machine greased. So with all the numbers for the box office weekend of January 16th to the 18th in, there's only one thing left to do. It's time to break it down. These past three days were the biggest January weekend on record with over $200 million in box office receipts. Leading the way was Paul Blart, Mall Cop, with a confirmed $33 million. Holy sh**. How the f*** did this happen? Seriously, was anyone expecting this? Okay, the two major factors here are the story and Kevin James. The story is basically a leftover Saturday Night Live sketch from 1995. You really get the feeling that this movie should have starred Adam Sandler like 10 years ago, or Rob Schneider 8 years ago, or even David Spade 4 years ago. Kevin James has a writing credit on the movie, and that's a good thing. While I wasn't a big fan of The King of Queens, I do like his stand-up and overall comedy style. But still, it's not like he's a major A-list star. The only movie movie roles he's had have been opposite megastars. He was a co-star to Will Smith and Hitch, Adam Sandler in I Now Pronounce You Chuck and Larry, and has voiced a couple of cartoons, Barnyard and Monster House. So here it has to be the concept that's bringing in the money. It's pretty idiot proof. The movie is about an underachieving guy working as a mall cop. The preview has enough funny moments to make it seem like there will be plenty of laughs, and it looks family friendly. That leaves it open to a huge audience, even those of us that are kind of cynical. It's really easy to say that this is another stupid SNL-type movie, like Dickie Roberts' former child star, Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, Tommy Boy, or even Happy Gilmore. One major factor working for it is that it's the first comedy of the year to be released. Right now, theaters are filled with Oscar wannabes and horror movies. While the economy is in the dumps, and it's winter in America, many people just want to forget their troubles for a couple of hours. It seems that this is doing the trick for them. I'm pretty sure that on the set of I Now pronounce you Chuck and Larry, Adam Sandler gave some secrets to Kevin James. He told him he could fill the void left by Chris Farley for a well-rounded comedy actor that the audience has been waiting for since Horatio Sands let us down and Tracy Morgan lost weight. Then he told him about making a movie with the title of a wacky character, and how one way to write a movie is to take a drama and make it a comedy. Adam Sandler took Christopher Nolan's Memento and made it Fifty First Dates. Here Kevin James took Die Hard and made John McClane a down-and-out idiot. It worked. It's number one, and that means there's going to be some box office ramifications. First, Kevin James is now an A-list star, but he's not not a capital A-list star. Not yet. He's got to repeat this movie's success at least one more time. He's a lowercase A-lister. Paul Blart, Mall Cop Part 2, should be in the planning stages as of Sunday afternoon when the box office projections came in. In second place was Gran Torino. This is another surprise, with $22 million this weekend, and a total box office of over 70. What's shocking here is that there's nothing artificial about this movie. It doesn't have a slick marketing campaign, it doesn't have a cast of big stars, the title is metaphoric, and the story is quiet and not easy to understand in a sentence or less. Or, you couldn't pitch it in an elevator to a producer. But it does have one thing, Clint Eastwood. There are things in life that never lose their pull on people, and apparently, Clint Eastwood is one of those things. While the story here is kind of like Bad Santa meets Falling Down meets Karate Kid, it's Eastwood that gets us interested in seeing this, especially since it's a very different role for him. He's not really a good guy here at the beginning of the movie. Actually, he's a pretty big racist ass. But we want to go with him on the journey, and that's the other major factor, the journey, the story. It's not trying to sell out to the largest demographic. It wants to say something and doesn't care if everyone gets it. 
directed by the only badass Chuck Norris might be afraid of, whose official credits on this movie are director, actor, producer. Wow. At 78, he's at his creative peak. Next up for Eastwood as director is the biopic of Nelson Mandela, starring Morgan Freeman. Somebody call the 2010 Academy Awards and make room for this. This guy hits Oscar gold and pisses nominations. Even if this movie made no money and was a total flop, it wouldn't change anything. Clint can do whatever the f*** he wants. He is the man. And along with Spielberg, Lucas, and Scorsese, one of the most powerful filmmakers alive. And what's interesting about this box office is that it shows us that there's a demographic beyond the 13 to 35 year old males that Hollywood obsesses its marketing with. When I saw this film, the majority of the audience were between the ages of 30 and 60. This age range is often ignored, with the logic being that people of this age have bills, responsibilities like mortgages, and kids to send to college, so they don't want to waste their time and money at the movies. Leave it to Eastwood to prove the conventional Hollywood thinking wrong. Hopefully, this will mean more mature movies like this will be made, with stronger regard for the story's characters and message, and the mental and spiritual well-being of a good story-hungry audience, instead of the lone concern for the box office. The third place movie with about 21 million was this week's only horror movie release, a remake of the 1981 cult classic My Bloody Valentine. Here it's in 3D. This is the major reason it made its money. Watching a slasher take out victims in 3D is a fun experience with a large crowd, and this seems to deliver just that. You can't give credit to the actors because they're no-name B-listers or XTV stars. Perfect horror movie casting because it's low on the budget, which was probably around 20 to 30 million. So this movie has pretty much already made its money back. It's a hit after one week. So guess what? Yup, a sequel. My Bloody Valentine in 4D will be coming out next year. Right now, a script is probably being patched together. The director, Paul Lessier, who has a lot of horror editing and some directing experience, will have the green light to direct the sequel and at least one or two other movies, probably in the horror genre, which he'll be stuck in until he can prove that he can do other genres. In November of 2008, DreamWorks animation boss Jeffrey Katzenberg said that eventually all movies will be made in 3D. He's claiming the industry is committed to 3D and that it'll happen on all all screens, even mobile phones, claiming it's not a gimmick, but the way we want to see it's an immersive and heightened experience. It sure seems like 2009 will have a lot of 3D movies, so maybe he's not talking crazy. What do you think of this possibility, that all movies will be in 3D? Leave your thoughts in the comments section. In fourth place is Notorious, the Notorious B.I.G. biopic with 20.5 million. Wow, four movies making 20 million dollars, that's pretty amazing. The success here is due to the subject matter. Biggie is the attraction. That's why there's no A-list stars here. In fact, Jamal Woolard, the actor playing Biggie, is new to feature films. This is his first role, and he nails it. Expect to see him in some movies within the next two years, but it seems like he was born to play Biggie, so it'll be interesting to see him challenged in other roles. Not being mentioned in the advertising is a solid director, George Tillman Jr. He burst onto the Hwood radar with Soul Food in 1997, then made the Cuba Gooding Jr. Robert De Niro drama Men of Honor in 2000, and has been producing solid box office hits like Barbershop and Roll Bounce in the meantime, along with the TV series for Soul Food. This is his first time behind a feature film in eight years. That's a sign of someone in control of their career. He can produce what he wants and direct projects he likes. The success of this opening weekend should allow him to continue to be picky. His agents will get a lot more scripts in the mail and his asking price will go up. Finally, in fifth place, with 17 million Scooby Snacks, is Hotel for Dogs. Now, at first you think that's great for a kids and dogs movie, but the budget is $75 million. Holy f for what? There are no big name stars, directors, or writers. So how did this cost 75 million? It's based on a book. Wow, I can't get over that. Maybe they actually built a hotel. Or maybe the dogs had better agents than the actors. This movie's success isn't really a surprise. For some reason, people are in a dog watching mood right now. Marley and Me has made over 130 million dollars. And that's what made this movie a success, The Dogs. People want to watch dogs being cute and there's nothing wrong with that. The actors are all very young with minimal big screen experience. So so they'll all have opportunities in the next few years, but when it comes to their careers as adults, that's when the challenge will start. Director Thor Frudenthal has only made short films before this feature, so it's his first major credit. He's already got an interesting project lined up, titled Diary of a Wimpy Kid, which is another book adaptation. But his overall future success will depend on the final box office take for Hotel for Dogs. It'll have to make at least $100 million to be considered mildly successful. Thankfully, Dog Cute 
cutesiness is a universal language that translates to all cultures, and hopefully that'll help with the worldwide box office. The only problem is that it has no big star drawing power. As much as Marley and Me owes its success to Marley, Owen Wilson and Jennifer Aniston had a lot to do with the box office of that film. Hotel might not make its money back. Industry-wide ramifications will be minimal. Don't expect to see a series of dog movies just yet, especially if they cost 75 f million dollars. It'll take at least two or three more Marley and Me's to get the dog movie craze kickstarted. Until next week, remember, the movie future is in our hands. Hollywood gives us more of what we pay for, so choose wisely, and as always, Long live good movies!